Well, good morning. I'm Bob Hines. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so glad you could be with us this morning. You know, this has been a, a very uh, exciting and very hectic, very busy weekend. Uh, many of you may not know, but uh, Pastor Ryan and his, and his wife Stephanie, they raise miniature donkeys, and either Saturday night or early Sunday morning, they had a baby donkey. I think it looks just like Pastor Ryan. What do you think? <laughs> and of course, uh, Saturday night, we had the story tour here. And I, I want to thank each and every one of you who helped out. A tremendous turnout, a great, great response. People responded to the Lord, accepting him as a Savior. But I just appreciate the, the way you people stepped up and helped in many different ways. Um, how exciting it is to be in a church where we're seeing water baptisms happen so frequently. I just praise God for that. You know, water baptisms can be a, a giant step for some people. You know, sharing your testimony can be a little difficult. I, I, I get that. But again, your testimony is your best tool. Your story is, is helps other people come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. So that's the way we do it. So I understand it could be a giant step, but it's some that I think we all as believers in Jesus Christ need to take. Now, speaking of giants... <laughs> Most of us are familiar with the story of David and Goliath, right? If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, it shows us two insights about the giant. The story begins with a giant named Goliath. He was unexpected and unwelcome. He stood directly in the midst of God's people, and he defied them. He mocked them. He taunted them. He came forward out of nowhere and God's army was taken by surprise. Realize there was a fierce, fierce enemy coming against God's people, against God's army. This, this is much like God's people today. Giants come into our life and they're unexpected and they're unwelcomed. You see, it could be something like a phone call from the police station. We have your loved one in custody. It could be a phone call from the doctor's office. Oh, the results are back from your test. They're not good. We give you nine months to a year to live. It could be that you're into work, you're doing your job, doing a great job. Your boss comes up to you, gives you your paycheck and said, uh, your job's been eliminated. We don't need you anymore. See, giants come unexpected and unwelcome. These are just some of the personal giants that we encounter. And as the people of God, like the armies of Israel, we encounter those giants outside the church, but also inside the church. Folks, we live in what is called a post-Christian culture. It teaches relativism. Relativism is basically that everything is okay. There are no absolutes. We tolerate everything, everything except absolute truth. We're entering the holiday season. And, and politically, no longer is it correct to say Merry Christmas. Oh, we get to say Happy Holidays, right? And notice many public schools, no longer do they have Christmas vacation. No, no, it's winter break. And, and in public squares, we can't have a nativity scene set up because we got separation of church and state. It's okay to have a Santa Claus, but we can't have a nativity scene, which Christmas is really all about. That's the world in which we live. These are all giants that we encounter on the outside. But unfortunately, there are giants that attack inside the church as well. We have giants of apathy, people lazy in their faith. We have giants of tradition. It's not the way I, that's the, not the way I like it. Never done it like this before. We have giants of division. Giants tearing apart the body of Christ with the critical spirits, judging spirits, gossiping spirits. You see, these types of giants are being used to ruin the reputation in the community. And the enemy often prevails using giants to further his cause on earth. Listen to me. God's people, God's people doing God's work will always, always, always face giants. God's people doing God's work will always face giants. And so there are three truths that we need to remember when we face the giant. Truth number one, giants do not create our spiritual condition. Giants do not create our spiritual condition. 
They only reveal them. Giants do not create our spiritual condition. They only reveal them. We hear people say, well, I, I never had a problem with worry or fear. I, I never had to worry with doubting God until now. Really, what you should be saying is, I, I, never, I never worried about things because I never had this to deal with. I, I, I never realized how much doubt I had of God until now. You see, giants simply reveal what's already in there, what's already in our hearts. Giants do not create our spiritual condition. They only reveal what's in them. Truth number two, God permits giants in our path. God permits giants in our path. Why? To teach us. God permits giants in our path to teach us. Goliath carried the biggest shield there was. And understand, when God permits a giant in your path, what he's going to be doing, he's going to, carry, he's going to be carrying the biggest mirror you've ever seen. Why? Because God wants us, as it says in Romans 12, to take a sober self-assessment. God wants us to see our heart the way he sees it. He wants us to realize where we need to grow and where we need to be changed. You see, God permits giants in our life not to defeat us. God permits giants in our life to defeat the sin that's in us so that we can accomplish his purpose here. God permits giants in our lives to teach us. A third truth, we cannot maintain the status quo when giants are in our lives. We cannot maintain the status quo when giants are in our lives. Either we will exercise our faith and grow, or the little faith that we will have will erode. You cannot stay the same when there's a giant in your life. When we look at Goliath, he was standing in a valley between two mountaintops. Look what it says here in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 8. Then he, Goliath, stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to, to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. Folks, understand, back in those days, oftentimes when, when they would, armies would go to, to fight, they would call out the best warriors from each side. And, and the two warriors would battle it out. And, and whichever warrior won, then the, the, obviously their, their army was victorious. They believed that the God of the warrior would determine who is victorious. Do you understand now why this is so important? Because they were representing the living God. Israel's army was representing the living God, and yet they didn't stand up to him. I want you to notice the last part of this verse. Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. Goliath was down in the valley. He was lower than all the others, lower than, than the army of Israel. We skip down to verse 16. It says, And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days morning and night. 40 days of taunting. 40 days of harassing. 40 days of challenging. And nobody stand up to him. He just come in and, and, and he would mock them and taunt them over and over again. Nobody stood up to him. When, when, David's, when David comes to see his brothers on the battlefront, they tell him what's going on. And, and look what it says here in verse 25. Have you seen the giant who is coming up? Have you seen the giant coming up? Oh, wait a minute. In verse 8, remember he said, come down? Here he's coming up. Folks, don't miss this. After 40 days of Goliath badgering, taunting, mocking them, and no one doing nothing about it, Goliath said, well, if you don't come down to me, I'll come up to you. He wants to take them on. He's coming up after them. He's a bully, and he's coming up to get in their face, to, to flaunt it at them. God's army is losing ground. This happens to anyone of us who does not challenge the giant in our life. We will lose ground that we already have. And that's exactly what's happening in the American church today. Many denominations have given in to the pressure of culture. They won't stand against the giant that is pressing in. Compromises happen. They've given up ground to the enemy, and, and, and we're not meeting the giants head on in our country. We run from them. Folks, understand the giants only reveals what's already in here. Well, that brings us to the second insight. That is the giants reveal, the giants reveal three types of warriors. There's the unanointed warrior, there's the once anointed warrior, 
And then there's the anointed warrior. We'll start first with the unanointed warrior. They were warriors of the living God. They made up Saul's army. Look what it says here in verses 10 and 11. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. Folks, these men were fighting for their own freedom. They're fighting for their nation. They're fighting for the freedom of their families. Is there anything that's a greater motivation that, as a soldier than to fight for the freedom of your family? If there is, I can't think of it. They had heard the gruesome stories of their ancestors and how they'd been, once been in slavery. Don't miss this. This unanointed warriors, they were highly, highly motivated. They're highly motivated because they're fighting for the freedom of their families. They were experienced. These men had been in battle with Saul before. They were experienced warriors. They knew what to do. And these warriors were well equipped. They had all the weapons of warfare they needed. And yet, what do we see? One giant appears, and suddenly they were dismayed and greatly afraid. That Hebrew word for dismay means breakdown by confusion and fear. They didn't know what to do. They were frozen in fear. You see, unanointed warriors do not recognize the opportunity. Here they had an opportunity to glorify the living God, but they didn't recognize it. Unanointed warriors do not recognize the opportunity. They cannot see past the adversity and the problem. Again, we go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And in verse 20, it says, So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. Understand, Jesse is David's father. He, and it says, And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and, the shouting, and shouting for the battle. The army was going out to fight, shouting for the battle. You know what this shows us? Even though they were paralyzed with fear, they knew how to fake it. You know any Christians that know how to fake it? They were paralyzed with fear. Yeah, folks, understand, they're like Barney Fife. Remember Barney? Ah, we can do it. That's what they're like. They're paralyzed in fear. But, but once Goliath appears, what do they do? They start backing away. They're afraid. They were fakes because they went through this cycle day after day after day. 40 days he came out taunting them. 40 days they backed away. Their bark was louder than their bite. Even though they, they represented the living God, they didn't place any trust, any confidence in him whatsoever. You know, some of you here may remember Back in the 70s, the evangelical churches would sing a chorus that went, God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. And yet the studies show that this began the mass exodus from the inner cities into the suburbs. The churches were selling their properties and moving out. Why? Because the suburbs were safer. So singing the song was a lot like the Israel's army, saying uh, we're, they had the right battle cry, but running in fear when the giant himself shows up. You see, God has not called us to safety. God has not called us for comfort. God has called us for obedience. And so even today in the church, I think we miss this. Unanointed warriors resent being told they should be different. Look what David says here in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. David is saying what should have been said all along. He says here, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You know, if that happened today, you know, David would be highly, highly criticized. How can you talk to dear Goliath like that? You'll hurt his feelings. <laughs> You're not showing a mercy, David. <laughs> Come on, have some compassion on poor Goliath. Isn't that what we'd say? Stop and think back of the recent election. If you caught any of the TV commercials about the politicians that were running, there was one theme that came through very, very clear. 
Any politician who stood up for right to life was demonized. And I'm really concerned that even in the church, we are confused on this issue. You see, society wants to call it a woman's right to choose, but you know what God calls it? God calls it murder. One of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 13, says, you shall not murder. And Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Spiritual leaders who speak out against us are, are called unkind, uncompassionate, uncaring, unliving, or unloving. Listen to me. It doesn't matter who serves in the White House. America's not going to change by who serves in the White House. America's only going to change when the Church of Jesus Christ stands up and follows the examples of Acts 17.6. It says they turned the world upside down for God. Now, I, I do want to be, I, I want to be very clear. If you're here and you experience abortion, please understand God loves you. God's, God's compassionate. God is caring. We as a church want to be comparing. But what I want to make sure is we understand we have to set a standard in our society and it's up to us, the church, to do that. Well, David's older brother detested David for calling out what he should have been doing. Eleb Attack David's personality. Notice what he says here in, in verse 28. Now, Elib, his older brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Elib's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why do you come down here? Look at this. And whom have you left these few sheep in the wilderness? You, what are you doing, kid? You should go back, take care of the sheep. I know your pride. I know your insolence of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. Understand, this is the same brother that when, remember when God was choosing a different king, he sent Samuel to Jesse's house and, and, and Samuel went in and he saw the older brother. He said, surely this is the one. And God said, uh-uh, oh, uh-uh. No, man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart and he passed over him. And then what happened is little brother, the shepherd boy, is anointed to be king. Eleb had a lot of resentment. And don't we see this happen a lot in the church? God begins to move in the church. He, he encounters resentment from people within the church. Church is getting too big. I don't like the direction we're going in. I don't agree with all these changes. Remember, every time there's been revival in God's church in America, it, it creates awkwardness. It will, there will be create messy, messy times. Messy times because God starts meddling in our lives and, and all that we're doing. And, and God's people begin to get angry. We resent seeing what we should be doing and we're not doing it. That's what happens in revival. There, there, there begins to be backlash within the church. The unanointed warriors have the theology of impotence. The theology of failure, of helplessness, of powerlessness, of weak, of no backbone. They're specialists in saying, Oh, that'll never work. We can't do that. Never done it that way before. They shout loudly about the battle of God, but they're all talk and no actions. And you know what I've noticed? These are the ones that are experts at what you should do. But they never want to get their hands dirty. No, 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 no. You should do this. Well, that brings us to the second kind of warrior. And that is the once anointed warriors. The once anointed warriors. King Saul was this type of warrior. Samuel had anointed him. And remember, he prophesied under the anointing of God's Holy Spirit. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 6. It says, then the spirit of the Lord will come upon you. You being Saul. The spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. There's going to be something different about you when the Spirit of God comes upon you. That's what he's saying. And yet years later, what do we find? We, we, we see that, that this king has compromised. This man who had the Spirit of God in him, he's compromised God's word. He has disobeyed God's word. Oh, I don't want to do that, God. I'll do this. He's more concerned with his reputation than anything else. What do people think of me? Are they going to think I'm a failure? Are they going to think I messed up? He is more concerned about his reputation. He did not care about glorifying the living God. You see, King Saul became very, very paranoid. 
This once anointed warrior compromised, disobeyed, concerned about his reputation, and no longer is glorifying the Lord. Look what it says here in verse 14. This is 1 Samuel 16, 14. It says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. It troubled him. Right after David was anointed with the oil and received the Holy Spirit from God, it became evident to God that Saul was not going to be obedient and lead the people God's way. And so God removed the Holy Spirit from him. Saul should have been the leader of the army. He should have been the one to go out and take on the giant. He should have been the one out there encouraging the soldiers. We can do this. But he didn't. Understand, back in those days, soldiers were taught to die in obedience for their cause, not for to run in fear. To die in obedience to the call, never run in fear. When David comes forward and, and he is determined to take on the giant, notice Saul's response. Verse 17, verse 33. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for you are a youth, and he's been a man of war since his youth. You can't do this. You ever had anybody tell you you can't do this? You ever sense God wants you to do something, and then others come along and say, oh, you can't do this? That's what the situation David is in. You can't do this. Saul is now guilty of the theology of impotence. He he could have shown all the reasons why David's plan wouldn't work. He was sure God couldn't work through David, this young kid. Go back, take care of the sheep. How often have we heard others say, you can't do that. You won't make it work. You can't do this. See, there's nothing more tragic than a person who holds a position of leadership and the anointing has left him or her. Saul was the once anointed warrior And he couldn't discourage David. So what does Saul do? Well, he offers David his armor. Come on, put on my clothes. The last thing David needed was armor. David was used to fighting wolves and lions and bears. He was the master of the quick strike. He had to be quick on his feet. He he needed mobility. And what happened, Saul just weighted him down with all that armor. He couldn't move. He was hindered. When the anointing is gone, oftentimes the church tries to address the giants by putting on someone else's armor. How? Instead of seeking the leading of the Holy Spirit, what do we do? We just look at what other churches are doing. How are they doing this? And then what do we do? We just copy and paste. We, we take a cookie-cutter approach uh, to the pattern of their service, and, and we try, and what to, and try and mimic their ministries. And most of the times they don't work. Why? Because God wasn't leading this change. Man was. God God doesn't call us to put someone else's armor on. God calls us to walk in obedience to the whole leading of the Holy Spirit. We're to walk in the discernment of the Holy Spirit. God speaks to us individually. He speaks to us corporately as a church. And it should not come from another source. It needs to come from God, the Holy Spirit. So David told Saul, no thanks to the armor. And Saul watched this young boy, David, who was brave enough to go out and take on the giant, who was obedient enough to take on the giant. All the men of Saul's army were afraid, and so they just stood by and watched. Saul watched this young boy do his job. How often have we sat back and watched somebody else do our job? We think back and realize, you know what? I should have been there. I should have been doing this. I don't want us as a church to sit back and watch other evangelical churches doing what God has called us to do. I don't want us to miss out on the blessing that God has for us. I want us to be involved in in making a difference in a sin-sick world. The lack of anointing has reduced Saul to being a spectator. You know what? America has reduced Christianity down to being nothing more than a spectator sport. We show up for an hour on Sunday morning. I got my job in. You know what that is? That is the former, that was someone who was, once was anointed, but has walked away. Well, that brings us down to the third kind of warriors, and that is the anointed warriors. The anointed warriors. David was that kind of warrior. And what does it mean? Anointed means people who have given a, given a supernatural ability by God, God the Holy Spirit, to exercise their gift when surrendered to Jesus Christ. 
People who are given a supernatural ability by God to exercise their gift when surrendered to Jesus Christ. Now that supernatural ability could be either be a spiritual gift or it could be natural talents. But concerning spiritual gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see a list of them, but he starts in verse 7 by saying, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. See, the spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. When we recognize we're sinners, repent of our sin, and ask Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, God the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. And, and God the Holy Spirit chooses which gift we should get. Some get one, some get more than one. But we're all given a gift. And what he wants us to do, he wants us to work to bring unity in the body. Notice what it says here. It's for the profit of all. For the profit of all. You see, diversity of gifts is to unify us, to, not to cause division or competition. And yet, I see this happen over and over again in the church. What you, what you are gifted in or you're passionate about, you, you, you get like a silo. You're so focused on that one ministry that you forget about the rest of the church. We, we got to step back and realize God has given us different gifts, different passions, different desires. Why? To be unified that we can make a difference in this world that he has placed us in. God wants us to work together. You see, the, the gifts that are mentioned here, and again, you go back in 1 Corinthians 12 and read about it, but the gifts that are mentioned here are, are, are to be handed out to believers so that they will know what to do. We know what to do. We know when to do it. We know what to do, when to do it. We know why we're doing it. And we know how to be effective for Jesus Christ. You know, Pastor Luke mentioned earlier the Equip series. I think that's one of the great things about this. So many times as Christians, we don't really know what our gift is or how we fit in or what we're supposed to do. That's one of the reasons that we've come up with this material. You see, that is what the anointed person does. God, where have you gifted me? What natural talents have you given me? Where do you want me to serve? What do you want me to do? David had that. In chapter 17, David relied on God's spirit for strength, for guidance, for direction. And, and when we walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we will see opportunities that God wants us to take because God has a plan and he wants, he wants us, he wants to use us to see that plan fulfilled. And if we are afraid, dismayed, and back away, God will get somebody else to fill that void. We miss out on the blessing. And that's what so many people don't understand today. We're the ones that lose out. You see, God's anointed Christ, we cannot fail. Unlike the lion or the wolf or the bear who would sneak up behind David, Goliath came right at him, right straight toward him. And you know what David thought? Thank you, God, this giant's so big, I can't miss. What's your attitude when a giant comes at you? I have to confess to you, that's, that's, that's not always the first thing I think of. <laughs> what is our attitude when we see the giants coming at us? We have believers that are ready to give up. They're ready to give up on God, ready to give up on the church, ready to give up on our nation. We, we are giving up on an opportunity to help others see Christ as they need to see him. Jesus Christ has given us his life so that we can have life to the full, the abundant life as he talks about in John 10.10. And what do we hear? Uh, we hear things like, well, I'm done in the church. Nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. All they care about is nickels and noses, nothing more. Today, people are proud to tell us, you know what? I'm nothing but an atheist. I don't believe in God. I don't think he exists. Those that have given up on God and given up on our church are, are missing the opportunity that God puts in front of them to help the atheists see that there is a God, a God who loves them, a God who died for them, a God who has a plan and a purpose for each and every life. But we miss that opportunity. God wants to have a relationship with them. And oftentimes he's using us to build that bridge, to share the gospel with them. Instead of being discouraged and giving up, we need to see the harvest is out there. Remember the Bible says the harvest is plentiful. Folks, think of all the unsaved people, the unchurched people that are living around us in our communities, our neighbors. The harvest, the harvest is plentiful, but it also tells us the workers are few. You see, people are walking away from their faith and, and they're, they're being apathetic. They're sitting on the sidelines. They're cowering in fear. 
They're dismayed. What do you do when you, you look out at our world? What do you think about when, when, when you see our country today? I have to admit it isn't very pretty. We live in a broken society. And what is this broken society doing? It's introducing evil to our children and our grandchildren. Terrible evil things. There is a growing voice that, that is boldly fighting against Christian values, against biblical values. Christians are being silenced, and many are doing nothing about it. God has called us for such a time as this, and we cannot fail to be part of the army. You see, we need to make sure which army we're involved in. I don't want to be part of the unanointed. I don't want to be part of the once anointed. I want to be part of the anointed warrior's army. Amen? Amen. You see, instead of looking at the reasons we can't, let's be bold warriors and know that without God, we can do this. With God, we can do this. Without God, okay, we'll fail. But with God's help, I cannot fail. In Psalm Psalm 37, in Psalm 37, verse 23, it says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his ways. Let's Let's see opportunities to win people to Christ. Parents, I I cannot stress to you enough the responsibility that falls on your shoulders to raise up children to have a firm foundation, a biblical, biblical worldview. And and truth is, you need all the help you can get. Please make sure to have your kids in church. Have them come on on youth group on Monday nights. Why? Because we want to invest in your young people. If we could see what kind of stuff, what kind of junk our kids see and what they hear, it would like, most likely make us very sick. And what happens, what it does, it fosters confusion in their minds. They're not sure what to think. Well, I go to church and hear this, but I go to school, I hear this, I hear my friends do this. They're confused. We need to invest in these young minds. See, we, we need all the help we can to instill biblical values, biblical truth in our children so they can stand strong as, as a warrior when the giants come across against them. And the giants will come. It's not an if. It's certain. They will come. They're not able to face adversity or hard times today because they haven't learned to stand on biblical values. We have a responsibility to help them navigate through these tough times and turn to Christ for strength and wisdom and guidance that his word promises. So this morning, my question is, what kind of warrior are you? What kind of warrior are you? What kind of warrior are your children going to be unanointed, once anointed, or anointed? I don't know what you were before you came into service. I don't know what you were this past week, this past month. But I'm asking you to make a choice. If you're willing to say, God, today is the day. I want to be your anointed warrior. If you're willing to make that choice, I'm going to ask you to stand right where you're at. Today, God, I'm going to be your, I want to be your anointed warrior. If that's your choice, will you stand? I want to pray for you. You know, in a moment, we're going to sing a closing song, that, and really, I, I want this closing song to be our theme as we go out. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you know those that are standing right now. We recognize in our own weakness and, and human frailties that we, we often aren't able to accomplish things. But God, we know through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, that you will fill us, you will guide us, you will direct us to be the men and women of God you want us to be. I pray for each individual right now who is standing, God, that you would be anointing them with a special with your Holy Spirit. God, that they would sense your hand upon their shoulder, that they would sense a steel rod going down their backbone right now that would give them a holy boldness and courage to stand up for you when the giants come into their life. God, you know the needs that are represented here, the different people, the different giants they're facing, but I'm praying, God, that you would enable them to stand strong no matter what they face. And we're asking that it all be done for the honor and glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray, and all God's people shout it out. Amen. Amen.